Dana Jacobson from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. A little extra dash of flavor or some sauce on the side can be a great compliment to any meal. So for this episode, seasoning and condiments are king. We'll travel to the birthplace of ranch dressing and learn the secrets behind a traditional Chinese topping, chili crisp. But we start in Baltimore, Maryland, where a once humble spice blend has become a popular seasoning on all sorts of foods. Here's Major Garrett. What's inside a can of Old Bay? Turns out there's a lot inside that red, yellow, and blue tin. More than just a spicy, salty, smoky seasoning blend. That's in part because of Ralph Brunn. Well, my father started a spice company in Baltimore in 1939. Gustav Brunn, Ralph's dad, fled Nazi Germany for Baltimore in the late 30s. He had spent actually 16 days in his, prior to coming here in a concentration camp. It sounds like a narrow escape. We got out. <laughs> It was a touch and go situation. Ralph was 14 when he and his family arrived with little money and fewer prospects. My father looked for a job and couldn't find one. And ultimately somebody told him, well, you got your equipment here, go get in a business. Right. And he did. He bought this mill in 1935. The equipment was an industrial spice grinder brought over from it's Germany, so central to the Old Bay story, it is on display at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Right. This machine doesn't make it to America. There is no Old Bay. This is true. This is what started Old Bay seasoning. At the time, Gustav made and sold spices mostly to meat packers for things like sausages, hot dogs, and bologna. His place of operation was directly across the street from the a wholesale fish market, which existed there at the time in downtown Baltimore. And that's how Old Bay found its way into the seafood you eat today. Fishmongers would buy Gustav's spice mix to steam crabs. Primarily, they used red pepper, used black pepper, mustard, celery seeds, that sort of thing. Ralph eventually took over the company before selling it to a British firm. Spice giant McCormick owns Old Bay now. This is what you do. You pick Not surprisingly, up. around a crab, Ralph Brunn is a maestro. Oh, no, 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 you don't do that. Your correspondent, not so much. He may be tolerated in Maryland. Keep that up. <laughs> For some, Old Bay is nostalgic, woven into mid-Atlantic Augusts of yesteryear. It takes me back to the warm weather. It takes me back to the beginning of summer. And if you haven't noticed, Old Bay is seemingly everywhere these days. Printed on shoes, aprons, bandanas, shirts, infused into goldfish, hot sauce, beer, and yes, vodka. Cheers, Old Bay! Greg David is CEO of George's Beverage Company, which took three years to develop Old Bay vodka, now sold in the Mid-Atlantic. The first batch produced 600 cases. And it sold out in 24 minutes. We've done almost 10,000 cases since the middle of March. The same is true of Old Bay Goldfish, also sold out in record time. Mm. Did you ever imagine a situation where this creation of your father's and your family's would become this sort of runaway brand that it's become? No, I had no idea it would do that. And of course, I wish my father were alive today in order to see us because he was proud of this was his baby. His father would also want to pay a visit to the Charmery in Baltimore, where Old Bay Caramel ice cream is a menu staple. That's amazingly good. And I'm not alone. You can feel the peppery tingling. I expected it to, you know, taste like the Old Bay seasoning, but it didn't have that. It was very smooth, actually. Amid the Old Bay mania, Ralph Brunn is a voice of reason, a reality check on seasonal spice swooning. Can you love this too much? I think when they get carried away with having all these Old Bay this, that, and the other that you're talking about, I think it's a little ridiculous, but that's what they do. It's a seasoning, that's, that's all it is. Coming up, we take a look at one of the most popular condiments in the world. We'll catch up with you right after the break. Found on burgers, dogs, fries, and so much more. Ketchup reigns supreme. But where would the delightful dip originate? Luke Burbank takes us from the Heinz Brands tomato fields in Northern California to hot dog joints in Chicago to learn more about what you could call the king of condiments. Ketchup is just one of those American things. So common, so typical, so ubiquitous that most of us never give it a second thought. It has everything that you could want. It's, it's sweet and sour, it's got vinegar in it, it's got uh, sugar in it. Andrew Smith is a food historian 
who says ketchup actually started out in what is now considered Indonesia as a sort of fish sauce called ketsia. British colonists brought it home, and then in the 19th century, it landed here, where there was an overabundance of tomatoes. If you had a ton of tomatoes in September or October, you had to do something with them, and one of the things that you could do with them is make ketchup. It took off immediately due to its ability to add flavor to things, and we mean everything. During the Depression, people would go into uh, small diners, and they would order a glass of water, and then they would pick up the ketchup, and they would add the ketchup, and they would have tomato juice at the end. It's not bad. Put a little vodka in there, a couple of olives. And the man maybe most responsible for ketchup's spread was a young German-American businessman in Pittsburgh named Henry J. Hines. He started out selling horseradish with limited success, but it was his tomato ketchup that really took off. So we're out in a tomato field in the middle of California. This is a tomato field that contains 4707, our workhorse uh, Heinz variety. Troy Shannon tomato. works for Heinz. This tomato is exactly right for ketchup. It's much thicker uh, and less juicy than a normal tomato that you buy in a grocery store. The 4707 has actually been patented by Heinz, the result of years of research and development. And after those 4707s are picked, they become the responsibility of Hector Osorno, tomato ketchup master. Really, that's his title. And he knows the secret recipe. Have they told you what's in the spices? Yes. So they trust you with that information? Yes. But you can't tell me? No. Osorno is one of only seven ketchup masters at Heinz. And sometimes what we do is just check. Charged with maintaining the taste, color, and consistency of all 650 million bottles sold each year. Oh, wow. You going to try it? Yeah. I'm going to just do this. Oh, OK. It's good. It is. But one place his ketchup mastery won't be necessary? Chicago. At least not when it comes to hot dogs. No ketchup. No ketchup. Anything else but no ketchup. It's like sacrilegious. Fresh tapped onions. Step right. behind the counter at Portillo's. A kosher dill spiller. And you'll see that Chicago-style hot dogs aren't hurting for flavor. Is there a strategy to eating a Chicago-style you know, dog? some folks take the pickle off and eat the pickle on the side. Some folks just grab it and dig right in and eat it as it is. And don't even think about asking for ketchup across town at the legendarily saucy Wiener's Circle. Can I have ketchup on there? Tacky, no. We don't think that's against the rules of a Wiener's Circle. We don't do ketchup on hot dogs, OK? Not in Chicago, either. No. And it turns out she wasn't kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Now go sit down and have it. OK. Eat it up. No ketchup, man. Well, I had to try. Chili crisp, once a relatively rare traditional Chinese topping, has recently undergone a renaissance in the United States and around the world. You can find it on dumplings, of course, but also everything from pizza to ice cream. Nancy Chen has more. Crunchy and textured. I love that sizzle. A bright collision of chilies and spices simmered in oil. It smells really good. Chinese chili crisp isn't spicy hot, but the condiment is on fire. Long ladled onto classic Asian dishes like dumplings, noodles, and stir fries, chili crisp is exploding in popularity, even expanding to the dessert menu. Is there anything you can't put it on? I have yet to find something <laughs> you can't put it on. If it's edible, you can put it on. Chef and Fly By Jing CEO Jing Gao adds her unique spin to the traditional topping by sourcing 18 ingredients exclusively from her hometown in Sichuan, China. Red chilies that are fruity, um, mild heat, super fragrant. The high quality ingredients from Chengdu, including Sichuan pepper and fermented black beans, aren't readily available elsewhere. But Gao gave us an idea how they all come together in her Los Angeles kitchen. What is the appeal here? Is it 
the spiciness, the texture. There's something about it you can't really put your finger on, but somehow it just works with everything, mm -hmm. right? It is basically just the components of chilies and oil. But when you add in those extra layers, that's what gives the chili crisp the extra dimension of flavor. And now the flavors are infused into the oil. Families in China have enjoyed their own time-honored recipes. And that's Mapu Tofu right there. Yes. But it became widely commercialized when a Chinese noodle maker bottled and branded her version. Log and Ma now produces more than a million jars a day for fans in more than 30 countries. We're playing a part in preserving that tradition by pushing it forward, by introducing it to new audiences. A culture and a tradition, if it doesn't evolve, it dies. So we want to play a part in evolving it in our own way. After leaving her tech industry job, Gao opened a restaurant in Shanghai focused on locally sourced ingredients before traveling the world as a chef in pop-up kitchens. For a very long time, people had not just a lack of awareness about what Chinese cuisine was, but also um, additional bias against it. Like that it's oily. That it's oily, that it's unhealthy, that it's low quality and should be cheap. Right, and so if those are the attitudes that people have towards Chinese cuisine, then there's no incentive for anybody to really bring anything of quality out. And it's about more than just the food too, when you talk about those perceptions. Absolutely. In 2018, Gao launched a viral Kickstarter campaign to fund her own signature chili crisp. And with more people cooking at home during the pandemic, her company has grown tenfold. The U.S. chili crisp craze isn't limited to store shelves and kitchen counters. Restaurants are also making it their own. That's two really good things together. Famed Brooklyn pizza maker Polly G recently partnered with family-run Xi'an Famous Foods for a pie centered around their secret recipe made up of 30 fragrant spices. This is Xi'an Famous Pizza. What do the chili crisps add to this? Texture. Even with more than 50 pizzas on the menu, G says this one quickly became a hit after its debut. Mm. We're eating pizza that's made out of an oven that came from Italy, and it's using spice that is inspired by something that people in China have been eating for centuries. And it's all made here in America. <laughs> Our goal is to change the conversation about Chinese food, to elevate its status in our culture. So we're really here to um, uplift all marginalized cultures, not just Chinese, and we're doing so through flavor. A melting pot of taste, melting together tradition and innovation. I have made a version of a mezcal paloma. There's a rim of mala spice. Oh. And then uh, a little bit of the chili crisp oil as well. Ah, well, cheers. Cheers. Coming up, a trip to the Hidden Valley. Pretty sure you know what condiment we're referring to next on The Dish. One of the most popular brands of ranch dressing, Hidden Valley, began in the mountains near Santa Barbara, California. Luke Burbank went there to get the story behind the creamy concoction. Amazing place, Hidden Valley. If you turned on the TV in the 1980s or 90s, there was one place where the hills were always green and life seemed a little simpler. Here in Hidden Valley, freshness is a way of life. Ah, yes. Hidden Valley Ranch, America's first and most popular ranch salad dressing. So squeeze on the Hidden Valley Ranch. And it turns out Hidden Valley Ranch was an actual place, albeit a very different looking one from the bottles, in the mountains outside of Santa Barbara. Hidden Valley was chaparral. It was wild California. This is the ranch. Alan Barker remembers the ranch and its owner, Steve Henson, well. Steve had an artistic truth in the sense that he told people what they wanted to hear. A fast-talking plumber who made it big in Alaska, Henson had a bigger dream of owning a ranch which he knew he would call Hidden Valley. There was a bare rug in front of a fireplace. He had, I don't know how many tales about how he had killed this bear in Alaska. The truth of the matter was he found the bear rug at the county dump. As a teen, Barker lived with the Henson family and worked at the so-called ranch. 
I wouldn't call it a ranch in reality. There were no animals, there were no crops, you know. It was a motel in the mountains. A motel that didn't have all that many customers. But what it did have was Steve Henson's homemade salad dressing, which he called ranch. He was trying to make a low-calorie substitute for blue cheese. From my memory, it was buttermilk, Miracle Whip, some spices, and I think some chopped up shallots. And then the ingredient that was kept secret, pure MSG. Hidden Valley ultimately failed as a motel, but exploded as a mail-order, mix-your-own salad dressing business, which the Henson sold to Clorox in 1972. When you're tasting prototypes of ranch, there is a threshold. After about six, seven, eight prototypes, you really have to kind of take a break. There's our pan. Lori Wellborn, a Brit who never even tried the stuff until adulthood, is in charge of how it all tastes. He's the head of R&D for HVR, as it's called by people in the know. It is a dip and it is a dressing. This is the thing, it's versatile. It's also a, something you can cook with. We've even seen our super fans bathing in Hidden Valley Ranch at times. These days, over on TikTok, ranch dressing is less of a salad dressing and more of a personality type. In fact, Wellborn claims that ranch now outsells ketchup in America. Quite the accomplishment for a salad dressing invented by a plumber at a failed motel with a made-up name. All right, cheers. Cheers. I'm getting notes of a valley. It seems hidden, a ranch of some kind. For more stories like this and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Dana Jacobson. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish. This episode of The Dish is sponsored by Prudential. Plan, invest, insure. Retire with Prudential.